Take your Bibles, if you would, and before we get to our text, <clears throat> begin with this in the chapter that precedes it, chapter 5. And I want you to, you know that uh, the numerical markers have been put there by man and the chapter divisions have been placed there by man, but actually this whole portion of Scripture is tied together back to chapter 5. It begins in verse number 18, where we visited a couple Sunday mornings ago. And be not drunk with wine wherein in excess, but be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. But then it begins to tell us how that we need to live relationships. And for these next verses, you'll find that it deals with the relationship between a husband and a wife. And then as we get to our text in chapter 6, we find that he deals with children, and then fathers, then servants. And then, if you please, the masters. And so you find that it becomes very clear as he introduces the Holy Spirit to us. He tells us that we are, we are desperately in need of the Holy Spirit to carry out what God wants us to do. You know, um, he instructs all of us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And without the filling of the Holy Spirit, every time we're unable to keep and maintain the relationships that God wants, to ha wants us to have in life, God never asks you to do anything you can't do without his help. And God gives us great power to do great things in relationships in life. And here as he puts it together and he addresses it and makes it very clear for us. The Bible is a very practicable, practical, livable book. As I said this morning, it has all the answers of life for it in it. And as God is good to us and giving us all the answers. I, I know we prayed much, but let's just make another prayer in our service, can we? Now, Father in heaven, we open our hearts and lay them out before you. And Lord, we've already asked your presence and your visits to be real to us this hour. I pray, Lord, that your, your Holy Spirit will direct in the direction of this message and the words and go as prepared and have things in place in our mind and on paper. We pray that you'd be able to direct us to the way you'd have us to go. Father, we, we don't know that we understand your fullness or your visits from heaven, but we know that we do need them. We know that we want them. We're hungry for them. And we need them in our lives, even this hour. So, Father, we do read your instructions about being filled with the Spirit of God to have the right, right relationships in marriage, children, dads, servants, and masters. So, Father, give us your touch tonight. We need so much a visit from you. Lord, we will do our best with our words, but without your very presence, without your Holy Spirit, Lord, we'll go away with missing something. So, Father, we desire for your people, these people, to have a moving of the Spirit of God in their lives. And so as the layers of coldness and callousness and the world takes its toll on us, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you bring us back to the place we need to be. Father, touch, Lord, your word to our hearts, and we'll love you and be grateful for it. In Jesus' name we pray and ask, and amen. Look with this as we read our text here, beginning in verse number 1 of chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. It's interesting as God begins to give directions, he stops all of the word of God in all eternity, and he says, now I want, I want all the kids 
to give me their ears and I want them to hear the instructions from the Lord. And the Bible says to the children that they ought to, my friend, obey their parents in the Lord. That's very interesting. You know, I think um, probably in different occasions we'd all want to quote that verse to our children. But probably we haven't quoted that verse as much, but we try to implant within their minds that they should obey the parents. But can I say that for a child to obey his parents, that's a spiritual command, amen? Are you with me? It's a spiritual command. The Bible tells us that the children ought to have the instructions from the Word of God and places, my friend, their specific instructions to the children, the little people, our little ones that are about us and around us. And I think it's very important for them to be instructed from the Lord. The instruction comes to children that says that they ought to obey their parents in the Lord. It was always interesting word, not obey your parents, but you obey your parents in a different relationship because of a different religion, because of a different reason, and that is obey your parents in the Lord. That word obey simply means to submit, submit to authority, carry, carry out the wishes of your mother and, mother and father. If for the little guys that are here, I want to give you tonight 10 reasons why you should obey your parents. Number one, or number 10, I'm starting backwards. Number 10, your parents brought you into the world, number 10, amen? Number nine, and your parents can take you what? Out of the world. That's why, amen? You ought to obey your parents, amen? Squeeze that little guy so he knows he's listening to me. Don't you do that, Marion? Amen? Number eight, because your parents are probably bigger than you are. I say that probably because Stacy's the shortest one in her family, amen? And I can remember Shuggy taking her fist and beating on my son Danny's chest, Amen? He wasn't paying any attention, but he would be if, if he didn't turn around quick, you know. Number seven, why ought children ought to obey their parents in the Lord? Because you will reap what you sow. You will reap what you sow in life. Number six, your parents love you more than you know. Why should you, why should you obey your parents? Because they, they love you, my friend, more than you ever know. Dad, one day, as he got older in life, he said, son, I want to tell you something. He said, and then he sat down and try to tell me how he loved him. And then he just kind of gave up and he said, son, you probably won't know how much you love, I love you until you have children of your own. And you know, I'm amazed at how much we've been loved and how much we can love. Amen? Can I say number six, your parents love you more than you know. Number five, you ought to obey your parents because your parents are smarter than you think they are. I think that's a good one. And all the parents said, amen? Amen. Number four, it will spare you from a lot of danger and trouble in your life. If a, if a little person or a young person will listen to the parents, it will spare them a lot of danger or trouble in their life. So much, so much we can learn if we're wise enough from those that love us the most in life. Number three, it helps you learn to honor and obey God. You understand the relationship between a parent and a child is the same relationship between God and you and I. And so for us to learn to honor our parents at a tender and a young age is so very important because we learn then how to obey God. I find that if a person or a little person doesn't want to obey their parents, my friend, then they'll have that same attitude to the Lord. I find when they want to honor the Lord, I find they'll want to honor their parents. Number three, uh, excuse me, number two, because it's right. The Bible makes it very clear because for this is right. Obeying your parents is the right thing to do. Amen. It's a right thing to do. And then lastly, because there is an eternal reward for obeying your parents. I remind you that the Lord Jesus, when he went to Nazareth and got separated from his family, when they found him, the Bible said that he was subject unto them at the age of 12. He was subject unto them. He obeyed his parents. Amen. Um, it's very important as he gives us instruction to these children. He said, first of all, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And then it says, honor, honor thy father and thy mother. Um, it's a, it means that we should have high respect for our mother and father. How many still try to honor your mother and father? Even after they have passed, amen, both dad and mom have already passed. I still honor my father and mother, amen. It means to have high respect or to give them privilege in your life. As we'd honor someone of great esteem, we should give that same respect to our mother and our father. We ought to be careful about that. Young, you know, young people who love God will, my friend, want to love their parents. It's spiritual. 
It's a spiritual thing that God instructs us in his word. He tells us you must have the Holy Spirit in you as well as my friend an adult, a daddy or a husband and wife in the preceding verses. But in order to carry out, my friend, the commands of God, there'll be places and times when you'll not have enough power and enough strength to do it on your own and you'll need the Holy Spirit's help to do it. Well, the Lord leaves the children, then he goes quickly to the dad. He doesn't mention the mom. It's interesting in this relationship, Brother Matt's going to have the privilege to dealing with that text, and so I've skipped over that in chapter number five, but, but it's very interesting. It tells in the scripture about the man that he needs to be the great lover and the great leader. It talks to the woman in chapter number five and tells that she needs to be the most lovable and the most leadable. But it's interesting that three times it tells a man that he should love his wife. Never one time does it tell in this text that a lady should love her husband. We hope you do, but the command was not there. It's very interesting as God gives those commands of instruction. But now here, it talks to the men. It talks to the fathers. And fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Provoke. It means to do something to arouse their anger or to push them, my friend, to act wrongly in their character. It means that a father has a power in his life and his influence, my friend, that we can cause that young person to make them react wrongly. Uh, I, I, I say this um, so you might understand that era, era of time. The father, my friend, in that time, in the Bible time, my friend, was the law of the home, and no matter what he did, no matter what he said was to be followed and to obey. There was no question about it. There was no doubt about it. There was no hesitation about it. He was who he was, and so the caution now, by God's inspiration, he said, now fathers, provoke not your children. Be careful that in, in the process of being the father in the position that, that you don't bring your children to wrong places and push them, my friend, to places, my friend, they should not ever have to go because of you. You know, and then it says that a father ought to bring them up. Uh, it means start where they're at, bring them up. So start when they're young. The picture is, is for a father to take that child when he's little and bring them up. And it uses two words, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He said, so a father has a responsibility given to him by God. It doesn't say one thing about mother. It does say in this text about the father, okay, now take them as soon as you can and bring them up all the way through step by step, age by age, um, um, chapter by chapter in life and bring them up all the way through. Uh, it talks about the consistency of a father and that how his, that he needs to have that touch upon, needs to have that touch upon their life as they're brought up and the uh, effect of the father. The effect of the father is just absolutely uh, amazing. There's nothing like the touch of a mother, but when the absence of a father, it's very difficult. I, I say this and I stop and pause and put everything aside for this reason. The book of Psalms, chapter 68 and verse number 5, some of you guys need to claim it. Some of our kids need to claim it. deals about the father, talks about the father. It talks about the fatherless, those that have no father, rather death or whatever might have happened in life, the carelessness of a father, whatever it might be. But the Bible said that God has a special promise that he leaves to those that have no father. He said that he would be the father to the fatherless. He would be the one that would step in the place of the father and he would mentor. And from a young and a tender age, he'd bring you up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That God would do special things for that one that has no parents about him. I, even as I talk about it, my body gets, um, I, it's hard to explain uh, the emotion that I feel as I think about God specifically taking my friend and bringing that a young little boy or a young little girl up without a father. I can go into a home and visiting and, and uh, many a times I can tell if there's a father in that home because of the reaction or the lack of reaction of the babies, of the children, especially when they're little and young. And some of those little guys, if you reach down and give them a little attention, you know how much I love children, you get a hold of them, they don't want you to let them go because there's an absence of that father figure. Now. Now, let me say this right, not the absence, my friend, only of a biological human male, but there's an absence of a father because every little son and every little daughter has been created by God to have a, a, a father, and, and, and they need that. It's a part of life. It's a part that they need, and God's put that need in there. God said, I'm going to step in in a special way and be the perfect father to you. 
for you that have no father. You know, it, God gives us the instructions that we need to, we, we to bring them up, start where they're at and take them through every step and every stage and then nurture them. Um, nurture deals with something in a state when they're very tenderly, very tenderly and gingerly uh, encourage them in stages of growth. And then there's another word, the admonition, different than that word nat uh, nature. Admonition, it means to counsel them and warn them, bring on both sides of the instruction that a father has a responsibility with his son, with his daughter, to bring him up in the nurture and the admonition, the counsel, the, the talking. Um, I just say this as I pass, no matter what you do with your family, no matter what it is, no matter where, it, where you've got to go or what you need to do, it's always a good time. And to spend time, my friend, is the most valuable commodity, the most valuable thing you can do with your family, just to spend time with them. And, you know, sometimes we equate, you know, if I take little Johnny out to the, to the ball game and I watch him play ball, there's nothing the matter with that. It's, it's all good about that. But sometimes, my friend, we watch them, but we're not with them. What they need from you and me as parents, they need that, that nurturing. They need that admonition. They need the time of your life. It's, it's, it's not the most expensive place you take them. It's not that at all. It's not that at all. It's, my friend, the fact, my friend, of your impact and molding the life of that little being that God's entrusted to you. And God given you that responsibility. He said, you can't be drunk with wine, but you've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit and have the right relationship at home and then have, have the relationship, right relationship with your children and bring them up, bring them up. I told you some years ago probably about the illustration of Sunday as he was a great, 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 powerful, powerful man with the Lord. And he got to the place of his dying, and it was really sad, and then his song leader and so many times those men would have song leaders that literally become a part of their spiritual team. And it's the process of his dying, so his song leader got to him and is trying to encourage him. And he went down the list of all the accomplishments of the great evangelist, and he got down after he did all that he could do and said all he could say. But he said, I've got one I didn't win. He said, who is it? He said, it's my son. And he said, I trade all of them for one son, one son. So I tell you tonight that the Father has an awesome, life-changing responsibility. You know, every time I see a father take his son or a daughter or a wife and bring him to the altar just to pray and talk to him it's, and talk to the Lord, I'm telling you what, it's just, just, just something they need. They, they need to see. They need to feel. They need to know. There's something about that, bringing them up, starting where they are, starting young enough so that you can impact their life in the fullness of their life bringing them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, bringing them to the place, my friend, so when you are done with your stage and your step of your life, that, my friend, they're ready, ready to face life just like you are. They might not have all the experiences, but they're ready. There's something like it. Shuggy and I have talked about this. You know, both of our fathers were very, they've had some they have rough pieces in their lives, rough life, rough, rough. Um, and I don't say that dishonor, but there's one thing that stood out very clear and plain. And though their lives were not in balance, they were just not in balance right. They just didn't have good balances. Um, they loved us. They loved us. I bought a Cushman scooter home on the school bus with special permission in 13 pieces. <laughs> and Dad rebuilt the thing and put it together. And we had a great time with it, but what was so neat about that as though we didn't have money, Dad took time, he took time with me that made such a difference. I'm saying that, my friend, we have a responsibility as fathers to be all that God wants us to be. And gentlemen, you might not be able to hear the cry of your children, but they need you. Shuggy used to go home and still sit on her father's lap. Still sit on her lap. You know, it's interesting, when it talked about that, we provoke them not to anger. It's interesting, I say this, don't make it hard for them to love you or to obey you. Make it easy for them. 
Make it easy for them to love you. You want them to love you, but it's the way you're bringing them up in the nurture and the admonition without provoking them, without pushing them to anger, pushing them across, pushing them to the place where they turn on you. I'm, I'm saying that there's, there's times in life when little people go through times and as they grow, they'll go through different times when they're, their heart is not turned towards you and they're not wanting to obey and you need to be careful and cautious and have the Holy Spirit's help as you lead them and you take them to the place, my friend, where they will listen. I say make it easy for them to love you. I don't think we need to spoil this generation. I don't think we, we need more things. I think they need more of us. Um, I don't know if you're a fisherman, but you need to go buy a dozen worms or dig them out from under the stump or whatever. It doesn't make any difference what you do, but as long as you can be with them so they're assured that you love them. Don't, don't embarrass your children. Be careful that, that, that you're, you, you make it easy for them to love you. So God said, okay now. And be filled with the Spirit because you're going to have a wife, because you're going to have a husband. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, children, because you have an assignment been given by you, by God, that you need to obey your mom and dad. You need to do what they say. You need to honor them. For this is right. Unto the Lord. I said, dads, you've got a solemn responsibility that we'll stand accountable to God for. You okay, know, dads, get this right. Don't mess this one up. And then he moves on and he brings up the next relationship, and that is found in verse number five. And our Bible says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, because you're saved, be different, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or he be free. And then all of a sudden, it begins to talk about the servants. Slavery was a common part of the culture in the day of Paul. It was a different shade of slavery in the fact that a person that was a slave if it was a common thing for a slave, my friend, to be able to buy his freedom of that day. And so unless you'd had a very cruel master, you could buy your way out of your slavery. And so understand that it was common, and so the word slave or slavery is very an interesting word. You know, and it's very interesting. He said, now, first of all, he said, you servants or slaves, if you please. We would, might use the word, we could apply it very clearly as an employee. An employee he said, first of all, he says, be obedient to them that are over you, that are your masters. Be obedient to the people that you work for. Do what they ask you to do. You know, that seems to be real simple these days, but it's not real simple. I mean, it's just different. And it says as we go along, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Notice these strong words, with fear and trembling, with fear and and trembling, that fear, that word literally means with respect because of the, who they are, and trembling, honestly knowing who they are, with a singleness of heart or having a one heart. In other words, that your heart is not divided, you're working with somebody, you're working for somebody, and have a single heart, one heart, that you're there on purpose, and you're there for a work, and you do it with respect and gratefulness and gratitude. And then he says, it becomes very clear, I love these words, Flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. It was the will of God. Verse number seven, it says, unto the, un, unto the Lord. We ought to do it, my friend, the very best that we can do it. I, I, I read an article, it was very interesting. It's talking about the, the workplace in America. And they said after a person out of an eight-hour shift, after a person takes the, the given opportunities of the lunch and the breaks of the day, that American workers have, have, have give their confession and said that they pilfered away 2.9 hours plus their lunch, plus the break time of product productivity. Someone has calculated that and brought that across and said that it, take, that it cost the employers of America $759 billion every year just of unproductive workers. Can I say this, that if you are a Christian, the way that you work ought to be different than the way that you were before you're saved. 
Now, you might have had the ethic, and I pray on this crowd. I don't know why, but um, our, our church is a working church. They're people that work, and uh, they work hard. You know, they, and you, you all are working, work, hard-working people. We, just, we know the ethic and the responsibility of work. Whether we work for ourselves or we work for someone else, we're a hard-working people. But God made us to be working people. And if, if we're working for someone and we're the employee and not the employer, then we ought to do what the employee wants us to do because we're saved, amen? Because, my friend, we know the Lord, for this is the will of God. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not unto men. Very powerful. He said there in verse number seven in that fascinating words, um, with good will doing service as to the Lord. He said, a Christian now that's saved needs to so work for someone else as if they were working for the Lord, as unto the Lord. You, you do it as if you were working literally for the Lord. Do you know why? Because it is. In fact, my friend, when you are doing something for someone else in the will of God for your life, you are working for the Lord. You are. And you know, every management problem would be resolved, every union issue would be settled. You know, um, it would be completely different if, if everyone that was saved would work as if they worked unto the Lord. You know, I've been embarrassed in circles of conversation when men have corporations, my people were all in the GM industry and Saginaw and Flint, and, and it was very good to our family and still is good to our family. Shuggy's daddy, my grandfather on the lamb side, all involved in GM. They were very good to us. But, you know, the, the union got so powerful and, and men didn't have to work. And they would show up and be seen and they'd be gone to their second job and come back, sometimes, sometimes not. And the next week it would be their week to work. And the guy that was just a whole bunch of stuff that ought not happen. When you're a believer, you ought to be somebody that has a clean, clear testimony about work. Can you just say amen just so I can hear it? Amen. amen. Can I say there's no difference in being a pastor and a policeman if you're a Christian? It's on to the Lord. There's no difference between being a plumber and a preacher in the will of God, my friend, that we're doing as if we're doing it as unto the Lord. Amen? No difference. There's no difference in an accountant, my friend, and an evangelist. We say, well, they're different. A pastor and a preacher and an evangelist, they ought to work hard in a mission. They ought to work hard. Yes, they need to, but so do you. So do we. So do we. And then verse number eight, look as you see with us here in our text. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord. In other words, what he's done is going to make a circle and it's going to come back to him. Notice those words. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Rewards may not all be passed out down here, but they're all going to be passed out. The Lord doesn't pay at the end of the week, but my friend, but he does pay at the end of a life. And so much of life when you've been in it and you've been walking a while is it's the seeds that you've sowed, now they're coming back to you, and they're, they're they're being given to you by God, and God's doing things about you. God's doing things around you. God's doing things in your life simply because, my friend, you did what you did as unto the Lord. To the best of your ability, as if you were doing it for the Lord and you were working for him, and it was his business or his corporation or his office or you were his employee, and God said, if you'll do it, I'll make sure it gets back to you. You say, man, I'd like to have a pastor's reward. You don't need a pastor's reward. You need the reward that God wants you to have because of the will of God for you. No, God doesn't pay at the end of the week, but he does pay at the end of the life, and it's okay, amen. It's very interesting as it makes it clear. And then the last relationship, he said that we need to have right. He said the last relationship that we need to have because we're saved, we need to use our authority and our position right. In verse 9 it says, and ye masters, that's anyone that's in authority. That's the owners of business, that's leaders of corporations, that's, that's people that are over us and that, that give us direction in what we should do. And ye masters, do the same things unto them. You're not, you're not better than they are, you're not different than they are, your position is just different to them. Do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with God. 
He said, you ought to watch your words. He said, it's very interesting. Forbearing, threatening. Watch your words. Position brings power. Power, my friends, sometimes causes a person to change their opinion of themselves. The Bible says that it gives us instructions that we ought to be careful that if you are a person of authority that you forbear threatening. Your positions makes the words that you use more powerful. In other words, you just not the words of someone else of equal with them. It brings so much power. It's such a powerful statement. You're forbearing, it says, forbearing. That, my friend, that you and I as believers um, need to have a different attitude. I can, I can remember, we got bankers in here this evening, and I appreciate them, but there was a man by the name of Pence that, director now, David's son is the director of the Merchants Bank in our town, but we had been to three different banks trying to get, get a start here in Hillsboro and trying to get things figured out. Mr. Pence, I went to his office, I was very much intimidated. Remember, I'm 23, if he only knew how much money I didn't have, you know what I mean, how much money I didn't have, you know. But it's interesting that he had a chair sitting over his desk and he took that chair off the wall and brought it over and set it right beside me. He turned his swivel chair and sat there and talked to me. Like It was very interesting, the impact that he made on my life. And though he was a man in a means and position and authority, it was very interesting, very, very interesting the way that he handled me. And that's impressed me, and I've thought of that many a times in my life, of how I should handle someone else. And, and you know what? It's interesting that those of you that are here tonight that are in authority, you could say, well, I don't need the Holy Spirit's help. I've, you know, I've got this position. I've got this deal down, man. I've got this gig. I've got this figured out. I am the boss. I, I signed the documents. I, I settled the accounts. I, I put things in order. You must be very careful. He gives us very much caution there. He said, do the same things unto them. And if you walk any, any time and you keep doing right, you'll have people that will be underneath you eventually. Doing the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening. Be careful with your words. And then he uses another word, very interesting word. Forbearing threatenings, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Um, the next word is forbearing, but literally meaning to be patient with them. That, in other words, that we need to be um, restrained, that we hold back and not unload all of the truck. It's interesting that God said, okay, now you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit if you're going to be married. You will not have, you won't have enough without the Holy Spirit's fullness. You've got to have it. If, if you're going to get married to a man, you sure need help from the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord said, now, if you're going to marry a lady, she'll be beautiful and wonderful, but you're going to need my help. There'll be a few times you're going to need help. You've got to have that Spirit of God to keep that relationship. He said, now, children, stand up. He said, children, now, pay attention. You obey me. I'm going to tell you to obey your mom and dad. It's the right thing to do. And then he said, dads, he stops us and stands us out and said, dads, fathers. And then he talks to us of how to work. And then he talks about those, my friend, that are the bosses. I conclude by saying this. God is not impressed with our positions. But he is impressed with what we do with our positions. Amen. Uh, you say, well, you should see these guys shoot these balls. They can score over 50 points in one game against some real good athletes. God's not impressed. Amen? God's not impressed with a ball player. God's not impressed. Amen? God's not impressed. Are you with me now? Don't leave me now. Stay with me, Lucille. Amen? God's not impressed because you know who gave him that a talent? He might have developed it, and he might have honed it, and he might have worked on it. He might work on it every day, but guess what? He could have made me seven foot tall too, amen? Said the world can't handle him at seven feet, amen? He can't handle him. Seven feet. God's not impressed. He's the one that breathed and gave you the gifts. He's the one that gave you the talents. There's a difference, remember, between the talents and the gifts. 
He said, I've given you talents to live with. I've given you gifts, my friend, to spiritually serve with. He said, I'm not imp impressed with the positions I've blessed you with, but I am impressed when you ask the Holy Spirit to help you to be a child. You know, a big old covey of young ladies over there praying this morning. I, I, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Matt. You know, I just watch those young ladies pray. Man, sweet, man. Powerful. Sweet. You can't, you can't make it, young people, without the Holy Spirit's help. You can't make it. Dad, you can't make it. Working for someone. You can't make it without the Holy Spirit. You can't, you're not supposed to be able to make it. You're supposed to have his help. You're supposed to have a strength. Use it set on the big chairs. You don't have it all together. I give you the chair. I'm not impressed with your position, but I am impressed if you allow the Holy Spirit to mold you and to make you what you need to be. Very interesting in this text. God reaches down and shuffles all the cards and pulls up and says, okay, this is your turn, and this is your turn, and this is your turn, and this is your turn. I say all that to say this, that you and I are made to do great things, greater than you and I ever could accomplish within our own selves, way beyond anything we could do. And he's given us the Holy Spirit power to accomplish these great things. We must have it. We need it. We need it. Don't try to fix the boat when the boat's leaking. Fix the boat when it's on shore before it begins to get to the water and the water starts coming in. Amen? How many men have better put the boat in and forgot to put the plug in? Amen? Boy, I'll tell you what. That's a real blessing. You ought to do that sometime. Amen? Go try that one sometime. Ronnie, don't forget the plug. I'm saying don't fix your life when it's filling with water. Fix your life before you get to the water. Fix your life now, the Holy Spirit. Let's stand. Can we do that? I'm going to step away from the pulpit now and give instruction for this invitation. Tonight, if you're not saved, the Lord would save you if you'd let him. Tonight, the Lord would fill the void of your life, the empty spot, the empty hole. Tonight, tonight the Lord, tonight the Lord would do something real in your life that's eternal. Tonight he'd do it. You'd let him. You'd let him. He'd do it. Let him do it. I was with the dailies, and I, I made this statement during the service. You know, Jesus, every time he's around, he changes everything. So when Jesus comes into a setting, he always changes everything. But when we pray, we pray, we invite Jesus into that setting. We, we invite him in, and then he changes where we are. Where he, we ask him to come into that setting, we come into that situation, and he's the one that makes all the difference. Maybe you've got a son or a daughter, or you've got a daddy or an employer. Let's win our employers, Amen. Let's win our employees. Dad, I told you, was off balance and rough. When he got saved, he was still off balance and real rough. He did stuff probably, I'm not so sure it was right balance, but he, he got to a place of management and leadership, and every time he'd hire a guy, he'd come in and set him down, set him down across from his desk and talk to him about the job and what it would require of them. And he'd take out his Bible. He said, now, before you leave, I got something I want to show you. I got something I want to show you. And he showed those men how to be saved. Did they want to? Didn't make a difference. It's part of his interview. You know, that's just the way that works. I'm not sure it was all balanced. I'm not sure it's exactly the way to do that. I'm not sure about that. So I'm saying that makes a difference.